today we're in the uh, beautiful North Staffordshire um, around the Churnet Valley area um, we're actually going to Alton Terrace but we're going to pretend that the theme park doesn't exist today because we're going to be concentrating on mainly the historical features in the gardens and uh, just have a quick look at the house obviously but um, before we actually get to the gardens and the house what I'm going to do is have a quick look at some of the lodges the old entrances to the estate where you would have um, entered and approached by a sort of horse and cart or train or whatever so it should be quite an interesting day and there's so many historical features in the gardens and grounds halls and towers that just get passed over because all the concentration these days is just on the theme park but like I say we're just going to pretend that the theme park doesn't exist today even though you're going to see people around and whatever you probably hear the noises and stuff but it really is a hidden gem of historical importance so that's what we're going to concentrate on today so I hope you enjoy it okay so we've just uh, coming through the village of Denstone which is not far from Alton if we go over this old stone bridge we should come to the first lodge on the left hand side and I'm going to uh, park up on this bit of dirt on the right hand side but yeah this was the first old lodge we're going to show you you can't go in these days but I'm just going to park up so okay so this is the Quicksill Lodge which leads on to the Quicksill Drive um, this was built um, towards the start of the 1800s because uh, the Alton Towers estate was mainly built um, at the start to the mid 1800s and if you would have um, arrived by horse and cart at that time or horse and carriage uh, I should say um, this drive would have gone on for uh, several miles through uh, woodland and stuff and eventually it would have brought you out sort of where the modern day hotels are nowadays so yeah after you would travelled a few miles um, it would have brought you out um, on the edge of the gardens and that carriage drive within the park you would have had views of the gardens and stuff um, and eventually it would have led to the house and it would have been you know a very nice first view of the estate whilst visiting the house so that was the first uh, lodge the Quicksill Lodge um, that land now is owned by the world famous um, excavator company JCB and that company owns a lot of land around here so uh, yeah you can't really take that approach anymore but I have I have walked a lot of it because some of it's um, public walkways and it's quite interesting to be honest but it is a bit of um, a mission to be honest so yeah let's move on okay so this is um Alton Village, not far from Alton Towers now. And just after we've been through the village, down um, a very steep hill, we're going to get to the second lodge that we're going to look at. So over this bridge, which is called Lord's Bridge, after the uh, Lord Shrewsbury, around Alton Towers. And just coming up in front, this is what's called the Station Lodge. Okay, so this is the uh, more modern lodge. And this was uh, built for passengers alighting from the train station, which is just over the road. And this was designed by Pugin. As I was saying before the car came around the corner, uh, 
This was designed by Pugin and it incorporates a uh, gothic style which he was obviously synonymous with. Yeah, so this was built around 1849 to coincide with the building of the new railway station or train station which uh, obviously is just over the road. You can see some of the gothic uh, elements like the windows and stuff. And above the gate there, there's the uh, tall but coat of arms at the top. Yeah, so literally just over the road is the train station. And the train station was actually built in a different style to the uh, to the station lodge. Um, and it was built by a different designer. And if you look, you can actually see that that's um, built in a more Italianate style. We'll just pop down and have a quick look. This part of the Churnet Valley Railway is um, now disused, as you can see. Well, um, the track's still good for uh, bike riding and walking and stuff like that. And the train station, um, it's actually owned by the Landmark Trust now. And you can, uh, you can hire it to, you know, book it out for a weekend and sleep there and whatnot. Now, the Earls of Shrewsbury, um, they had their own sort of little suite of rooms built here to um, accommodate the guests and stuff who were arriving, and it's probably this little bit here. Yeah, so that was the, uh, the second lodge, the station lodge and the train station, which were uh, mid-1800s. So that was the... Uh, the more modern entrance in those days. So, under a minute's drive up the road from the station lodge, we come to another lodge, which is on the left here. And I'll just pull over on the right and we'll have a look. Okay, so this lodge is called the Pink Lodge or the Italianate Lodge. Again, due to its um, Italianate features. And maybe that's why the train station was built in an Italianate style as well. And this one was built in the 1820s, so that would have been, um, you know, another entrance for people arriving by horse and carriage. Yeah, so this lodge would have been for people arriving from a different direction to the Quicksill Lodge. Um, this would have been for people arriving from um, a direction uh, called Dimmingsdale via the uh, Earl's Drive and this little path down here goes through a bit called Barbary Gutter and um, I'm not going to go into it now but there's um, a tree with a legend called the Chained Oak down there so yeah this was a lodge for people arriving by horse and carriage from a different direction to the earlier lodge okay so let's imagine that we've just entered the estate from the Pink Lodge and we've come across this gothic masterpiece which is the Alton Tower stately home in front of us. Now in front of the house you'll see there's this uh, quite large boating lake. And this was built around 1810 and it was actually dug out by hand as would have been the way in those days. And at the end of the boating lake, you'll see what appears to be a seven arched bridge. And that's actually a sham bridge. And what it is, it's, um, it's designed to make the lake look like it continues on the other side, so that it appears bigger. But that's actually a sham bridge, and it, um, it carries the driveway up towards the house. And that bridge was apparently circa 1820 by someone called J.B. Papworth. Who's, um, who was sort of a garden architect in those days and he did um, quite a few things. So you can uh, read up about him if you want. So yeah, that's a nice, uh, nice lake with what appears to be a, a bridge at the end. And there's the towers behind. Now just past the boating lake, um, going away from the house, there's another little lake 
and this one's called the Industry Lake. And this was also dug out about the same time as the uh, main boating lake that we already looked at. Now at the end of the uh, Industry Lake, you'll see a castellated building, and that's called the Industry Stables, which used to be the stable block for the house. Now this was uh, built around 1813 and 1814 and apparently it was the work of Thomas Allison and Joseph Oyland. And this stable block as well as the, uh, the screen wall in front of it, uh, it's actually grade 2 listed. Now this industry lake and the uh, industry stable block, the industry name was actually taken from another seat to the Earls of Shrewsbury who owned the estate. Um, called Industry Hall, not too far away. Not far from the Industry Lake, we come across this rock formation here, which is, um, it's been called Stonehenge because it's basically um, Alton Tower's own little nod to the likes of Stonehenge. And apparently some of these rocks uh, reputedly weigh up to about nine tons each. And apparently Thomas Fredgley was responsible for this uh, little folly. And this would have been built in the early 1800s. And Fredgley was, um, was also responsible for a lot of work on the house. Obviously uh, Pugin came along later and added a lot of the Gothic elements and uh, some new rooms and stuff. But yeah, Thomas Fredsley was um, apparently responsible for a lot of the house. And this was also by him. Now we're going to head up uh, a bit closer to the house first. And uh, you'll see on the right here, we're at the other side of Papworth's uh, Sham Bridge. So you can see there's no water this side. It's just made to look like it from the other side. And you can see the Gothic... Uh, turrets and stuff of the house poking out from the top and between the trees and uh, the trees at the front of the house they're mainly cedar of Lebanon and uh, monkey puzzle there are some others but yeah what a view that white feature down there we'll get to it a little later and have a closer look but that's called uh, the Karajik monument now this little feature we're coming up to here it's called the White Bridge and this was um, basically to carry the drive from uh, the house down towards the stables and uh, Thomas Allison was responsible for this and it was built during the early 1800s so that's uh, yeah, an iron bridge and if you look from the bridge you'll see that it gives a lovely first view of the gardens Now as we approach the uh, ruins of the Alton Terrors mansion, this is an interesting little feature worth uh, noting. There's actually a little drawbridge here. Over a foss. And that drawbridge was to give access to a newly built chapel behind so that people didn't have to sort of um, go through the main bits of the house to get to the chapel they could just go that way and apparently earth excavated out of this foss or moat whatever you want to call it was uh, used to build a mound which had a dovecote on it at the other side of the screen walls over uh, in the distance Now I've just popped down the lake just to quickly show you something. If you can see that tree stump there that the uh, ducks are enjoying themselves on. There was a storm a couple of weeks ago and um, lightning actually hit that tree which was about 200 years old. It was um, at Cedar of Lebanon and the tree literally just exploded. And like I say it had been there for 200 years and there was just nothing left but a, a little stump with no bark on. It literally made the tree explode and all the bark come off the uh, remaining stump that was on it. 
and uh, I saw a little video of that actually happening because it was caught on CCTV. It was um, it's a bit frightening what the lightning can do, to be honest. So that's just down by the lake. Okay, so we're going to uh, pop around to the side of the house now to see if we've got access to um, sort of the little garden on the interior and to the ruins, but I'm pretty sure they're going to be closed off because basically Alton Towers just love to uh, close off access to them. I mean, according to English Heritage, it's supposed to be open for sort of so many days a year, but they don't seem to be playing ball at the moment. But as you can see, what a lovely house. Latest alterations towards the middle of the 1800s by Pugin. An earlier work by others. What a gorgeous house. And actually one of my favourites, even though it's a ruin. Yeah, so just as I suspected, the tower's ruins and her ladyship's garden are actually uh, closed off for no apparent reason by Alton Towers at the moment. But fear not, because I did a tour last year of the Towers Ruins and Her Ladyship's Garden, and it's on another channel. And I'll put a link in the uh, in the comments, etc. So if you want, when you finish this video, you can actually have a good walk through the ruins and uh, Her Ladyship's Garden inside. While we're here, we might as well just have a look at the grand entrance with the uh, two Talbot dogs standing in front, which are synonymous with the Earls of Shrewsbury. Now this little building here is called Her Ladyship's Oratory. And this was built around 1848. And this was actually um, designed by Pugin as well. As you can see, there's a star window at the end that used to have stained glass in it. You can see it's a nice little, uh, a nice little space. And that was where Lady Shrewsbury used to have a bit of privacy and stuff. And beyond the oratory, um, there's actually a courtyard and stuff that we can't get to yet because it's. Um, well, we won't be able to today because it's all um, it's all sealed off at the moment, which is a shame. Now, whilst we're on um, the south side of the Valley Gardens, we're going to just have a look at the Swiss cottage. This was built around 1835, and um, apparently this was uh, by Thomas Fragley as well. Yeah, nice little Swiss cottage, just on the edge of the valley. And it's actually better viewed from the other side of the valley gardens, to be honest. And this has also been known as the Harper's Cottage, because apparently um, the Earl of Shrewsbury, at the time, um, employed a blind Welsh harpist to play music in the grand entrance hall to the house. So yeah, it's the Swiss cottage, or the Harper's cottage. And you know, he, he played music and um, sang Welsh folk songs and stuff like that. From the Swiss cottage, there's a bit of a terrace and you can see into the distance. You see, you probably can't see, but in the distance you can see the Stonehenge that we were at before and there's a little orange array. And then in the distance, in the right, there's a white thing, um, that's called the Gothic Prospect Tower. And we'll pop over there a bit later, right over to the other side. So, so yeah, we'll pop over there a bit later on. Between the front of the house and the boating lake, just to the right, we'll approach what is basically the formal entrance to the gardens. You might be able to just see the white bridge that we walked over earlier. That goes across uh, this little arched entrance to the gardens. Yeah, so this is the main entrance. Where uh, the splendours of the garden start to come into view. Interestingly, just inside the entrance, there's a plaque 
to Mr uh, Dennis Bagshaw, who was responsible for restoring the gardens. I, th I think that was sort of the late 50s, 1960s. But um, they weren't so good for the house, which I won't go into at the moment. Okay, so venturing into the gardens, the first thing that you'll see is a monument here. It's called the Karajik Monument. And um, this was built by the 16th Earl, uh, John, as a memorial to the 15th Earl Charles. And on the front it says he made the desert smile. And what he means by that is, these gardens were basically just bare, just a rabbit warren, before the 15th Earl got here. And the 15th Earl is the one who's mainly responsible for the gardens. And there's a little bust of the 15th Earl inside. And apparently this is uh, modelled on the temple of uh, Lysicrate in Athens, which was built around uh, 344 BC. And it's, um, it's made of iron, which was cast in Derbyshire. I should note that the, uh, the bust, that was actually the work of uh, Peter Hollins, and that was sent to Rome to be executed in marble. And at the bottom of the monument, you can see here, there's a flower bed, and in the middle it's got an S for Shrewsbury, for the Earls of Shrewsbury, obviously. That's quite good, they're keeping that in decent order. And just another interesting note, um, before the, the bus that's currently there, the one that was executed in Rome, um, there was an earlier one by Thomas Campbell, but that was removed and uh, moved inside the octagon, which is um, part of the house. As we move down this path, not far from the monument, um, you can see there's this scalloped wall. And uh, on the wall, not far down, there's a little fountain that's uh, currently not working. And in some old guidebooks, that's named as the War Fountain. And I've got to be honest, I've got no idea why it was called the War Fountain. But again, you'll see there's a little uh, Talbot Hound head there. Again, which is synonymous with the, uh, the Shrewsbury Earls. And um, this type of thing, this basin here, I reckon that was for um, when carriages had um, arrived in the gardens and stuff like that. That could have been somewhere for horses to drink and stuff. So. I've got no proof of that, but I'm just, um, that's just a theory, anyway. Now whilst we're up this side, um, just behind the Karajik Monument, um, there's a bit of a terrace, and it gives a view over the gardens. And right down the middle there, there's supposed to be a canal, but it's overgrown with uh, reeds and stuff at the moment. Basically, this garden here is just full of different features and stuff, which we're going to find. Now again, not far from the monument, while we're up this end. Interesting feature here, by this little X gateway, as you can see, there's still the ironworks for the gates. But anyway, the most interesting thing about this little bit is, you see this thing uh, arching up here? That white thing is actually the remains of a whalebone. And if you can imagine, this was a whalebone um, sort of arch here, and it would have arched up to the top of the view there, and there would have been a bone coming from each side. So that's sort of the whalebone uh, entrance or walkway. So, so just that one bit survives at the moment. You can see a little bit just going into the floor there. So not many people know about that. In the trees behind uh, the conservatories that we'll have a look at a bit later, there's this um, just sort of gardener's body. 
that I thought I'd just have a quick look at. So yeah, just a gardener's body really. That would have been built uh, early mid 1800s as well. Not far from the Stonehenge feature that we looked at earlier is uh, this cottage. And this is called the gardener's cottage. And this used to house the, uh, the head gardeners of Alton Towers. Now it's hard to pinpoint the, um, the exact time that this was built. But um, down this alley on the right hand side that you can't get down anymore. That used to be accessible and I think I've got some old pictures or video and there's, um, there's a plaque above the door in stone and it says T.H. Raybone who was one of the, the old head gardeners and it's got 1873 on it so I mean that's a possible date that it could have been built and um, in more recent times it's been used as you know a cafeteria or something but we're talking sort of 1960s, 1970s sort of thing. And I think after that it's, um, it's been used to house amusement park staff and stuff like that. So Now literally just down from the gardener's cottage, you can probably see just over that fence in there's another little uh, residence. And that's called the gunner's cottage. Um, that's obviously a lighter building because it's brick built. And, um, I've got some old pictures and stuff somewhere before all that fencing was put up as you can see so I'll, um, I'll try and pop them on for you to have a quick look and um, that's also been used to house um, staff and stuff like that I mean being called the Gunners Cottage maybe it used to uh, home the gamekeeper or something like that of the estate so I'm not entirely sure As you can see, there's various tracks and stuff around the gardens. There's absolutely miles of them around. Now I know of another uh, secret little feature that's very little known. Just in these little uh, woods down from the Gunners Cottage, there's a very interesting little feature. And you wouldn't see it going past. It's actually an old water pump made of iron. And if you look at it, can you make it out? It says Bamford's. So that was probably uh, of JCB, JC Bamford fame. And so there's a wheel on the side to pump the water and stuff. And then the water obviously would have come out the uh, spout at the other end. So that's interesting. Now if we continue down the path from uh, the Gunners Cottage and the Gardener's Cottage we'll come across another lake and this is called the Lily Pond or the uh, Temple Lake as you can see it's known as the Lily Pond sometimes because there's loads of uh, lily pads and stuff on it there's actually some uh, decently sized fish and stuff in here as well and it's also known as the uh, Temple Lake of course, I'm um, not sure if you can see, but through the trees in the distance there's the uh, prospect tower that we looked at from near the Swiss cottage earlier. And some people used to know that as the temple, so uh, that's why it's known as the Temple Lake, as well as the Lily Pond. So, uh, when we come to the end of the Temple Lake, up these steps, you should start to see the Gothic Prospect Tower, which has also been known as the Gothic Temple in the past. And also the Chinese Temple, totally wrongly. But yeah. So yeah, this is the uh, Gothic Prospect Tower in all its glory. And this was originally conceived by the 15th Earl Charles Talbot and Robert Abraham. And this was built in around 1824 on uh, this little rock outcrop that's called, uh, it was known as Thompson's Rock. And then uh, several years ago, I can't remember exactly the year off the top of my head, but probably about five or six years ago, maybe a bit longer, 
this had a really good restoration and you can see quite the, viv the uh, vivid black iron bars there I think they were totally replaced and the glass and the doors and stuff like that and rock work was repaired and things like that but uh, the main structure um, it's actually iron um, and that was worked by the Britannia foundry in Derby as were quite a few of the other features in the gardens etc. On this uh, little stone circular bit in front of the temple, uh, Prospect Tower there actually used to be a plinth with a bust of the 15th Earl on it but that was uh, removed at some point. If you look down into the valley on the left hand side should be the Swiss cottage somewhere that we were at earlier then over towards the middle that's the towers and you can see the gothic towers which give Walton Towers the name down towards the right if you can find it you can see the Grand Conservatories on the right hand side and a couple more features down below that we'll get to in a little bit And apparently the Earl liked this feature so much that he had a miniature uh, version built and he had that placed in the entrance hall to the house but uh, that seems to have been lost to the sands of time or it's tucked away in some private house somewhere and they don't know what it is or whatever but it's a mystery Now just down from the Prospect Tower uh, there's another little feature just underneath and this is known as the bear cave it's a little cave here as you can see and we'll just pop round the other side now according to hearsay um, in the 1800s a black bear was uh, kept in this cave whether you choose to believe that or not or uh, apparently in 1857 a certain Mrs Tomkinson had a hand bitten off by this bear and um, due to that the bear was later stuffed and kept in the towers but um, like I say there's no actual evidence of that but uh, yeah interesting little cave and on the way out evidence of um, some kind of old gate or whatever yeah so that's the uh, the bear cave now again on uh, on a path just below the prospect tower around the corner there's a path here and um, eventually it leads onto something called the rock walk but there's no access at the moment but um, at the start of it here you can see there's um, a seat has been formed out of the rock here that's an interesting little feature and somewhere nice to have a rest Actually, I might have some sandwiches there in a bit. But anyway, if you were to follow that rock walk, um, it leads out into like sort of miles of woodlands. And uh, I've got some old pictures and stuff of when I've actually walked down there in the past, so I might just pop them up in a little while. Yeah, and on that rock walk, there's um, various sort of um, imaginatively shaped. Uh, rocks and stones and stuff so hopefully I'll get a couple of pictures on right now we're right down in the uh, heart of the valley gardens <coughs> we're not far away from one of the other main features which is the pagoda fountain but first on the way down there's this other uh, sort of little known just little decorative garden bit and it's actually called the heart garden it's hard to see without an aerial view but it's a little uh, path that divides off in two ways and it's in the shape of a heart I'm not sure if you can see it or not but yeah that's a little garden and uh, that would have just led up to the next level up those steps at the end I think I might have um, a little photo somewhere that I'll try and pop up that was from an aerial view on the one side of the valley he might just show you this bit a little bit better so hopefully that's popping up right now shortly we'll be having a look at uh, 
the pagoda fountain in the view down there. What a gorgeous view. First we'll just have a quick look at something else. Now just slightly up from uh, the pagoda fountain that we'll see in a minute. There's a, this little pond here which was called the Dolphin Lake. And in the middle you'll probably see there's a little mound. And there's actually um, like a little stone structure under there that used to hold a fountain. And that fountain was called the Dolphin Fountain. I imagine because there was uh, probably a statue of a dolphin spurting out water or something in it. But as you can see it's um, very overgrown with reeds and stuff at the moment so you can hardly tell it's, <laughs> it's a lake at all to be honest. Again, I think I've got some old photos that show it off a bit better so I'll pop them up I think. Okay so now we're on to one of the crowning glories of the Alton Towers Gardens and that's the Pagoda Fountain in the distance. Uh, and apparently this was modelled on the uh, Toho Pagoda in Canton, China. And again, the main structure of this was um, was iron. And this time it was cast by the Colebrook Dale Iron Company, which was uh, based around the Iron Bridge Gorge in Shropshire. As you might be able to see, this is on its own little lake as well. But again, it's a bit overgrown at the moment. Now this feature was designed by Robert Abraham and although it was started in 1826 it wasn't actually completed until during the 1830s. Now when the fountain is actually working and it does still work sometimes um, it fires a huge spurt of water into the air and I've probably got some uh, photos and video somewhere so again I'll try and pop them up shortly. Now this fountain, um, like all of the others in the gardens, it's gravity fed from uh, pools of water higher up in the gardens. And while we're actually talking about the uh, supply of water, for the main supply of water to the gardens, uh, conduits were built from um, somewhere called the Weaver Hills, at a place called Ramsar, uh, two or three miles away from here. So that's where how they got the uh, water down to here, which was previously just a you know barren rabbit warren. But that is a beautiful structure. Now originally, this was actually meant to be uh, six stories high, at about 88 feet. But um, eventually, when it was built, it was only built to three stories and around 44 feet tall. I mean, can you imagine if that was built to about double the height it is now? Room way up there. So, I mean, it's no wonder it was, uh, it was scaled back a little bit. So moving uh, up through the centre of uh, the gardens, down in the valley, come to another feature at the end of um, a little canal, which is overgrown. I mean, that bit in front of us, below, there is actually water under there, but it's just well overgrown. Again, maybe I'll get some pictures up when it's not overgrown. And there's a, there's a rock garden at the centre of there, at the end. And it leads up to uh, where the monument is, to the 15th Earl that we looked at before. The one that's modelled on the, uh, the one in Athens. And what I'm going to do, I think, there's actually some stepping stones to going through the middle of that rock garden. So I'm going to pop up there and see uh, if it's not too overgrown to have a look. So here we are, we've had a walk up the side of the rock garden. Hmm. As we can see, some stepping stones here. We can have a little uh, trek across. If you stand in the middle, you can see looking down the rock garden towards what should be 
the gleaming canal but uh, it's just reeds at the moment there you go a little bit of rockery and to the other side and a bit of water coming down there and up the other side okay so back down to the bottom of the rock garden and the canal and here we've got um, something called the iron bridge basically because it's built of iron again and um, according to some notes um, Thomas Allen Thomas Allison had originally designed the gothic stone footbridge to go here but that never uh, but that never came to fruition apparently so they've got this iron bridge instead which goes over a little canal but you can't actually see the canal at the moment so if you walk down along uh, the canal obviously uh, a man-made uh, mock canal which you can hardly see the water of at the moment you'll see there's a bandstand at the end of it now there's not a lot of uh, sort of documentary evidence about when this was built or whatever but it was probably mainly in use sort of the early 1900s to the 1940s sort of thing and a bit later on when uh, brass bands were popular and stuff like that yeah so this is the bandstand iron and wood construction by the looks of it There's the bandstand again from a slightly better vantage point. Now this feature here, quite a large feature, is called the Colonnade of the Muses and this again was built during the early 1800s. Um, and if you look it consists of uh, nine arches topped by nine Muses and Apollo from uh, Greek mythology. quite a nice large looking feature. Now what's an interesting fact is um, according to certain commentators at the, in the early 1800s these statues were originally in the house conservatory and incidentally these were uh, by Peter Hollins apparently as well. But um, after being moved to the colonnade from the house conservatory Apparently, at some point, uh, these were removed again, but then um, in more recent times, they were moved back to the colonnade. So uh, they seem to be have been on the travels a little bit, these statues, around the estate. And just in front of the colonnade, there's uh, a little sundial. Sort of inside the uh, colonnade, there's a nice little sheltered walkway under here as you can see and then at the other end some steps that lead you up to the next level but we're not quite going up there yet that's because we're going to have a little look at these two features first or one feature depending on how you want to look at it it's the bath fountain in an area called Le Refuge. So we'll just pop around the other side, I think. Okay, so this is from the other side, and um, it's fenced off at the moment, so we can't go in, but you used to be able to. And to be fair, I think that's to stop vandalism of the uh, of the statue there on the fountain. Now you can probably uh, date this quite accurately. It's around 1813, because um, Apparently there's a date on the base of the fountain, stating 1813, so... Now the figure on the fountain is um, an infant, uh, well the infant Triton, holding a conch shell, and that's where the water sort of spouts from when it's working. We haven't seen that for a little while. And that little figure um, was built by the Code Factory in Lambeth, so it's Code Stone. And, um, that has been vandalised in the past 
and it was took away and um, I reckon a decade or so ago it was restored and um, placed back where it is today. So that was good and that's why I think they fence it off now to stop it happening again. Now the wider area is um, called La Refuge and um, as the name suggests basically it was somewhere to sort of rest and recuperate. Now you can't actually see at the moment um, but inside that little alcove in there there's some doors and inside there there's a little fire and stuff like that so you could uh, you could go and dip in the bath fountain and then go in the little room at the back of the refuge there and you could uh, put the fire on and warm up etc. And I think that's because at um, some point during the 1800s there was a fashion for sort of dipping in the cold because um, I thought it had health benefits and such like. And to be honest, that's a bit of a fad that's come back now, isn't it, with the uh, people going and swimming in lakes and stuff like that, so maybe there was some merit to it. And apparently in uh, 1813, a local stonemason, Peter Ford, was paid to remove a pair of columns from the old um, north entrance to the main house, the Towers. Um, and he was paid to set them up somewhere called the Garden Alcove, so... If you look at the columns on the front of there, they probably came from the old main entrance to the house. I mean, it's not certain, but it's a good possibility. So yeah, that's the, uh, the bath fountain in La Refuge. Now just up the hill a bit from uh, Le Refuge is another feature, one of my uh, personal favourites. It's called the Screw Fountain. And if we uh, pop up there, we'll see why it's called the Screw Fountain. So the uh, Screw Fountain, this was again built in the early 1800s. And this was the work of Thomas Fragley again, who uh, you're probably realising did quite a bit of work around the estate. And like I said earlier, also the house. And uh, you'll probably tell it's called the Screw Fountain because of sort of the spiral design on it. We move down and have a little look closer. And this looks uh, really, really good when the fountain's actually working on it. Again, I'll try and get some pictures or video up of uh, from my past visits when it's been working. Um, other names for this used in the past: uh, spiral fountain, corkscrew fountain, candlestick fountain. So it's um, it's been known by a few names. As you can see, uh, behind there's a little, bra uh, little bridge with water running underneath. And that comes from the lakes at the top, like the, uh, the lily pond or the temple lake, whatever we're going to call it. And then it runs down and carries on down through the gardens, and eventually getting down by the pagoda, etc. And apparently, uh, back in the 1800s, this used to be adorned with uh, like various ornaments and stuff, but obviously none of those exist to this day. No. Now between these two stone pillars here with um, statues of lions on the top, there actually used to be some quite ornate gates on here back in... Uh, the 1800s and maybe into the early 1900s but obviously they're gone now and um, I've seen them referred to as the Golden Gates before and obviously beyond there you can see the, uh, the U arches and I'll try and pop a picture up of uh, those gates and um, interestingly these uh, stone lions I saw one of those being refurbished I think it was that one Again, probably about a decade ago. So you would have gone through the Golden Gates and then come across the uh, U Arches. And these are uh, probably some of the most photogenic bits in the gardens, along with some of the other main features. Incidentally, uh, this little terrace bit next to the U Arches 
This was known as Lady Mary's Terrace, um, after one of the children of one of the earls. And that's got statues and etc on it. Yeah, you can see a side view of the U arches. I think I've got an old picture somewhere of uh, the terrace and some uh, some old ones of the U arches when they not long after being planted or you know halfway grown or whatever. So I'll try and pop some of them up as well. Yeah, I've got another nice statue here. From uh, Lady Mary's Terrace you can see the bath fountain below and then the colonnade next to it with the bandstand beyond and then in the distance the uh, Swiss cottage again. When we come to the end of the U arches come to a little alcove down here. Nothing too spectacular, just a, you know, just a little alcove. And above that, there's something called the Conservatory Temple. And when we go up, we'll see why it's called the Conservatory Temple. Yeah, so we'll move up to the Conservatory Temple. Um, it's not certain who sort of designed or who was responsible for building this, but. Um, it has been said someone called Joseph Island was responsible for it. And um, interestingly, that name's also linked to um, another feature behind the house called the Flag Tower, which you can't get access to these days. But yeah, that's the Conservatory Temple. And there's a window at the back here. And that used to have stained glass in, which is no longer there. From here you can see the U arches, etc. In the distance up there you can see the prospect tower just through the trees a little bit. Yeah, so inside the temple it would have been a nice sheltered little seating area. And you could uh, look out upon our next feature, which is the wonderful Grand Conservatories. And they are quite grand. So the Grand Conservatories, uh, these were designed by Robert, a Robert Abraham and built during the 1820s. Now these conservatories, there was to be uh, a home for palm trees and other oriental and exotic plants like that. I'm not sure if you can see or not, but there's actually still a palm tree in there. I'm not sure if uh, you can see that or not. Apparently the uh, cost of this back in the 1820s to build was uh, £13,000 which as you can imagine that was a massive amount of money at the time. You might be able to see that uh, the domes have got pineapple finials on the top, finished off in gold. In recent times, um, some parts of these conservatories have gone into quite a bad state. So, um, in 2017, these were actually uh, refurbished to a really high standard. In total, there are seven glazed domes and the whole length of it reaches about 300 feet and uh, the largest central dome up there instead of having a pineapple finial on it it's actually got an earl's, co earl's coronet on it which I'll try and zoom in a little bit and we'll get a picture or something Wrong one. Again, the uh, iron used for the domes and stuff on it were uh, 
cast at the uh, Britannia foundry in Derby. Have a little look at this. I've actually got some um, old pictures of this, sort of from behind and having a look at the domes and stuff when they were all a bit derelict, so I'll try and pop them up for you just so you can uh, see what, how bad it used to be. Now on to our next little area or feature which has been known as the Dutch Garden and apparently um, the 15th Earl of Shrewsbury had quite a large input on the design of this bit and while we're talking about the uh, 15th Earl and his design um, apparently when he was sort of planning how the gardens were going to be set out in the initial stages he consulted some of the top uh, garden designers at the time to sort of have a look at a theme or whatever. But apparently after consulting him, he just uh, he largely ignored them anyway and just uh, decided on his own plans. So it's why you've probably noticed it's quite um, an eclectic mix around these gardens. And there's not just sort of one theme. I think he was criticised a little bit by uh, a couple of the designers at the time for uh, doing it in such a way. Now from the Dutch garden you can probably see in the distance uh, the Stonehenge that we were at before in the middle distance. Um, in front of that there's another feature that we'll see in a minute obviously. And uh, that lion that's at the top there, I don't think that was original. I believe there was a bigger lion that was in this Dutch garden and I think that sits somewhere in Stoke now it's some type of council property or something like that can't remember off the top of my head but yeah that's definitely not the original lion that was in this area and again this is a sort of bit of a fountain sort of water work that's not working these days I haven't seen that work for a while actually as you can see there's a, a shell and stuff under uh, underneath that lion and these bits and pieces are uh, getting worse as the years go on falling off and whatnot which is not good I'm sure when I started coming here they were all in place and God knows what that piece of rock is that's just falling off there and then just above the Dutch garden we've got something called the orangery or an orangery and uh, this was built around the same time as the Grand Conservatories obviously uh, just for cultivating more plants or you know fruit trees or whatever that could get away with and uh, it's a similar design to the Grand Conservatories to be honest in many ways there are some subtle differences but um, as you can see this is very derelict at the moment it's even uh, missing one of the domes completely off the top and uh, this was actually damaged by a falling tree uh, quite a while back but uh, yeah as you can see this hasn't been uh, refurbished like the Grand Conservatories have but apparently because the uh, theme park is going to be having a new ride it's been agreed that they're going to uh, sort of do some work on this and bring it up to scratch a little bit so we'll see how, how that goes over the next few years but yeah, it's not in the best state. And there's the Stonehenge through the back. And then through the front of the Orangery, you can see the Orangery fountain, which again is not uh, currently working. And this uh, would have been built around the same time as the orange room. Again, if I can uh, get some of my old pictures or whatever, 
with that working I'll stick them on for you. So you would have had a nice view of the, uh, the orangery fountain, the orangery and the Stonehenge behind. Incidentally, uh, <coughs> up on the level of the orangery, you can actually get a good view of the uh, work that was done on the domes of the Grand Conservatory below. And as we leave the Dutch Garden and walk back up to the entrance to the gardens, uh, all this grass here, this used to be known as the Italian Garden and it had various plants and flowers and stuff and sort of ribbon borders and stuff like that. Again, I'll try and get a picture up of uh, how it used to look a little bit. Yeah, so <coughs> that was the gardens at Alton Towers and hopefully uh, some of you have learnt a few things and uh, have realised that Alton Towers is a lot more than just a theme park. And these gardens and the house were here long before the theme park and you know, they'll be here long after the theme park's gone as well. So yeah, again, thank you for watching. Um, I really appreciate it.